Hey everybody, this is Thermodynamics for AP Chemistry in 10 minutes or less. This video is meant as a refresher on some of the major topics in Unit 6 and some of Unit 9 of the 2021 version of AP Chemistry. It's intended for students who have already learned the material and are beginning to prep for the AP Chem exam. For anyone that cares, it's going to cover the following topics from the AP Chemistry course and exam description. Let's get started. This video is going to be organized by what are sometimes called the three properties of thermodynamics. Enthalpy change, or delta H, entropy change, or delta S, and free energy change, or delta G. Let's start with some sign conventions. Negative delta H means the reaction is exothermic or releases heat, while a positive delta H means the reaction is endothermic or absorbs heat. A reaction will be exothermic anytime the product bonds are stronger since more energy is being released as they're formed than is being absorbed as the reactant bonds are broken. For the same reason, the reactant bonds will be stronger in endothermic reactions. A negative delta S indicates that the disorder in the reaction will decrease where a positive delta S means it increases. Disorder will increase anytime the product particles in a reaction have less freedom to move or less possible arrangements they could exist in and the opposite is true for reactions where disorder increases. And lastly for a delta G if you say negative value that means free energy is released positive means that free energy is absorbed. And this is really important because if it's negative that tells us that the reaction is thermodynamically favorable or what is sometimes also known as spontaneous which really just tells us if the reaction can happen on its own or not. And if it is favorable, meaning it can happen on its own, these reactions could also be called product favored, and you can expect K values greater than one. The opposite is true, of course, for positive delta G reactions. So let's jump back now to delta H and talk about some of these stoichiometric problems that are common for delta H values. If I had this balanced reaction in the accompanying delta H value of negative 480 kilojoules per mole reaction, and I was told, let's just say that 10 grams of hydrogen gas was reacting, according to this equation, I could solve for the quantity of heat that was released or absorbed. First, I would change grams of H2 into moles of H2. Then, in what you could call a mole ratio, I'd say that there's two moles of H2 for every one mole of reaction. It's essentially like saying that there's two moles of H2 every time the reaction happens. And lastly, I can convert from moles of reaction to kilojoules or heat, with the enthalpy itself. Notice I left off the negative, you can leave it in if you like as well, as long as you're aware that we're just solving for some quantity of energy and that negative simply tells me that the quantity we solve for is being released. In this case, we would get 1,200 kilojoules released. And lastly, there's lots of different ways you can calculate delta H values. The first one is an equation where you add up, so the sum of all the enthalpies of formations of the products minus the enthalpies of formations of the reactants. Using what is called Hess's law, I can add two or more reactions together that are connected via some common intermediate. Here to ensure that the particle C cancels out, I might find that I have to double or change the reactions in some way. That'll change the coefficients of this first equation to two across the board. And since I doubled the reaction, I also have to double the delta H value from 10 to 20. Now I can add up these reactions and some of these particles will cancel off like the two C's on opposite sides and the two B's on opposite sides making the net reaction 2A plus X produces Y. I could then calculate the enthalpy value for that net reaction by simply adding up my altered enthalpy values here 20 plus negative 30 giving me a final answer of negative 10 for the enthalpy change for the net reaction. Next, we have a lab-based method that is really important to AP Chemistry called calorimetry. In calorimetry, at least the most common type of solution calorimetry, you take an insulated container and add some water. Inside that water, you perform some type of process or reaction that either gives off or absorbs heat. Since we're assuming this is a closed system, the heat that the reaction gave off, here labeled Q sub reaction, is equal to the heat that the mixture or the solution itself gained. If the reaction is giving off heat, we're going to make sure to put a negative sign with that. If the reaction was absorbing heat, there'd be a positive and the negative sign would be over here since the mixture or the solution is the one that's losing heat. I can then solve the quantity of heat that the reaction released by solving MC delta T for the entire mixture. Finally, I can turn that Q reaction into an enthalpy by simply dividing it by the number of moles of whatever the limiting reactant was in the reaction. 
we can also use bond energies or bond dissociation energies. And there's a couple different ways to go about it, but I'd recommend a simple equation where you add up all the bond energies of the reactants and subtract out the bond energies of the products. This actually is not given on the AP equation sheet, but I recommend using it because it makes the problem very simple. Luckily, calculating entropy changes are a lot simpler. There's really only one common way to do it. You can get the delta S by adding up all the entropy values of the products and subtracting out the entropy values of the reactants. It's more common rather than doing the actual calculation of delta S to instead make general predictions about whether the sign will be negative or positive for a given reaction. So to go over this, let's make a list of times where disorder increases getting a positive delta S value. The reverse of anything listed here, of course, would give a negative delta S. So the first thing you're going to look for with the largest disorder changes are going to be changes in phase, like a solid changing into a liquid or a gas, or even a liquid that changes into a gas. If there is no phase change between the reactants and products, then you can look at the quantities of moles. If there's fewer moles in the reactants and more moles in the products, that's an increase in disorder too. Another common one is a solid that dissolves and becomes aqueous. This is usually a small increase in disorder, although be careful because there is an exception to this when very strong solute solvent bonds are formed. Sometimes the products do actually have less disorder than the reactants. Now with delta G, there's actually lots of different ways to calculate it, but they all pretty much involve plugging numbers into various equations, like the sum of the free energies of formation of the products minus the free energies of formation of the reactants, or delta H minus T delta S, we'll talk more about that one in a second, or negative RT ln K that links delta G to the equilibrium constant or even negative NFE if your reaction was a redox reaction and taking place in a standard electrochemical cell. And while these equations do show up quite a bit, it's probably more common to make some predictions about the sign of delta G you're gonna get based on enthalpy, temperature, and entropy using this equation here, delta H minus T delta S. So let's imagine a scenario where we have an exothermic reaction where the entropy increases. I'm gonna plug in the sign conventions we'd expect there negative for the delta H. Our temperature is going to be in Kelvin, which is always positive, so I can plug in positive there. And if entropy is increasing, then that's going to be positive as well. Well, for this type of reaction, you could predict that you are guaranteed to get a negative result for your delta G because you have a negative number being subtracted by some positive numbers, which no matter the magnitudes of those quantities, you're going to get a negative result. This tells me that exothermic reactions with increasing entropy will always be spontaneous or will always be thermodynamically favorable under any temperature condition. Another way to say this is that these reactions are both enthalpy and entropy favored. If, however, the reaction was endothermic, so we'd have a positive delta H, still positive temperature because we're using Kelvin, but if entropy was decreasing, so a negative delta S, in that type of scenario, you have a positive number minus a negative number. This T delta S term becomes negative, and subtracting a negative means you're really just adding a number. So a positive number plus some other number, here you'd be guaranteed to get a positive result for your delta G. This type of reaction is not favored by enthalpy or entropy and will never be thermodynamically favorable. If both delta H and delta S are negative, then you can't say for sure the sign of delta G that you're going to get. What I can say though is that in that type of reaction, I want to keep my temperature low to keep this T delta S term small so that it doesn't overcome this negative delta H. In this type of scenario, low temperatures will generally lead to thermodynamic favorability. If delta H and delta S are both positive, the opposite is true. We're going to want high temperatures so that T delta S term overcomes the delta H term and we get a negative delta G value. There's two other things you may come across. One of them is why a negative delta G reaction will not happen in real life. This is called kinetic control where the activation energy for a reaction might be so high that even though the delta G is negative, you can see the products have less energy than the reactants here. So free energy will be released. Even though this reaction should be favorable, it takes such a large amount of energy to get it started that it never actually gets started or it 
is so slow that we can never really observe the reaction taking place. The other scenario involves a positive delta G reaction that's not favorable, but a way that you can force it to take place is via something called coupling. Let's say I want to perform this reaction A turns into B and X to produce this product X. But the delta G is positive, which means this reaction will not happen on its own. Well, I could force this first reaction to happen by coupling it with a second reaction that shares a common intermediate with the first one here that would be particle B. Via Hess's law, I can see that the net overall reaction would produce this particle X that I'm interested in, and that coupling will be effective as long as when I add up those two delta G values, I get a negative delta G for my overall reaction. And that wraps it up for thermodynamics for AP chemistry in 10-ish minutes or less. Thanks for watching.